member for Vermilion Lloyd Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak on Bill 2, and at this time I'm uh, very pleased to be able to offer some perspective uh, as a member of, uh, of the past government and uh, as being the first speaker from our caucus to address Bill 2 in second reading, and also as a member of, a uh, former member, uh, rather, of, of Treasury Board that was involved in some of the uh, decisions that were made leading up to the uh, most recent budget, uh, in fact, the budget that uh, uh, the interim supply estimates uh, are based on, as correctly pointed out by the government house leader. You know, it's been interesting over these past six or seven days that we've been sitting the, to hear uh, the 44-year record of the Progressive Conservative government over that period of time be repeatedly vilified by members on both sides of the House. Um, you know, uh, quite frankly, I'm still very proud of that record regardless of what has been said here. And I would hasten to remind members within the House that you only stay in power for that length of time if you win elections throughout that period. And indeed, the Progressive Conservative Party did maintain the confidence of Alberta, Albertans in 1975, in 1979, in 1982, in 1986, in 1989, in 1993, in 1997, in 2001, 2004, 2008, and 2012. And Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, it's worthwhile to point out that when members in the House criticize 44 years of progressive conservative government, they're indeed criticizing 44 years of electoral decisions made by Albertans. That's right. And you're so praising the decisions that were made on May 5th, I find it interesting, and I also find it very interesting, quite frankly, the various interpretations of what that decision meant. And I find it very interesting that the party opposite now in government uh, feels that it is a carte blanche endorsement of all of their policies. I would encourage you not to fall into that trap. Indeed, uh, people vote in an election for a wide variety of reasons, and they make decisions for a wide variety of reasons, and you should be cautious that the endorsement that you receive from the people of Alberta is a carte blanche endorsement of all your policies, because it is not. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, I found it very interesting as well. Uh, you know, I'm going to make a couple of references to the bill at hand because I do have some very specific concerns that nobody has addressed and we'll, we'll certainly address these in Committee of the Whole. But most specifically, on the very back page of the bill, the coming into force date of the bill is listed as January 1, 2015. Retroactively to the beginning of this year, this government wants to have the coming into force of this bill extend to a period five months before they were even elected. Really? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I find that to be an incredible statement. And the other thing I find interesting on page 7 in, uh, in, section, uh, in section 6, subsection 2, the calculation on the increase in the personal income tax, which is to go up on the 1st of October, that because it extends for an entire year, will indeed extend over the full year of income for Albertans. No other way can you achieve the rates that you're asking for, but, or demanding, I should say. But indeed, what this does is it means that on income that has been earned by Albertans in the affected tax brackets between January 1st and the date of passage of this bill, they will be assessed additional in income tax on that income. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if you happen to be in a position where you retired, or lost an election, or for some other reason had your flow of income significantly drop after the uh, first of, uh, or uh, from the first of January to the present period, and then the subsequent period, uh, you're now going to have the additional surprise from this government of paying additional tax on that amount if you're in the applicable uh, tax brackets. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I find these changes to be very, very troubling. You know, Mr. Speaker, I represent the. Uh, uh, constituency of Vermilion Lloyd Minster, and I've made my home in Lloyd Minster for the past uh, 30 plus years. And uh, I live two miles from the Saskatchewan border. Uh, I, I live there by choice, and uh, I'm, unlike a certain uh, former, uh, former uh, governor of Alaska, 
I can see Saskatchewan from my front door. In fact, the joke is I can see all the way into Manitoba, given the uh, rail. But, uh, but uh, Saskatchewan, our neighboring province, has indeed had an interesting history. And I will tell you, the border city of Lloydminster is a very interesting uh, study, case study, of uh, differing government uh, policies. In fact, it's a bit of a petri dish, and let me sort of outline for you. My honourable colleague uh, next to me from Strathmore Borks has, also point, has already pointed out in 2005 that the NDP government recognized that there needed to be some taxation changes. A couple of years later, the good people of Saskatchewan recognized that there needed to be a government change. That's right. <laughs> and to turf out the NDP that had been dragging their province down like an anchor for so many years. And what do I mean by that? Well, Saskatchewan at one time was the third largest province in Canada. When was that? Behind Quebec, Ontario, Saskatchewan was third, going back to the 30s. But thanks to a succession of CCF governments and then a number of NDP governments, Saskatchewan never grew. In fact, the province of Saskatchewan's population has fluctuated around the one million mark since the 1930s, and in the last few years of the NDP uh, administration in Saskatchewan, in fact, Saskatchewan's population was declining at a regular rate. People were leaving Saskatchewan in droves, especially young people, and there was virtually no growth in Saskatchewan. Businesses would locate preferentially, in Lloydminster at least, on the Alberta side, not on the Saskatchewan side. If you're saying, well, that's because of the sales tax, well, there is no sales tax anywhere in the city of Lloydminster. Let me give you some comparative growth rates that illustrate this. From 2001 to 2006, the Alberta side of Lloydminster grew population-wise by 21 percent. During that same period of time, when the NDP government was in power in Saskatchewan, the growth on the Saskatchewan side of Lloydminster was a meager 3.5 percent. From 2006 to 2013, the Alberta side of Lloydminster grew by a further 26 percent. And from 2006 to 2013, during which time the Saskatchewan uh, province had the benefit of the Saskatchewan party, a conservative party, the growth on the Saskatchewan side of Lloydminster was a whopping 41 percent. People chose to locate to the Saskatchewan side of Lloydminster because there was an advantage to doing so. Let me uh, say a few other things that changed in Saskatchewan. Uh, prior to 2008, Saskatchewan was a province that received equalization payments through the Federal Equalization Program. It was a great source of pride to the residents of Saskatchewan when they no longer were a have-not province in 2008. And that was largely because of government policies that had been brought in to make Saskatchewan a more competitive, more tax-friendly jurisdiction. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, one other thing that I will tell you that is also a source of pride to the residents of Saskatchewan that may or may not have as much direct reference to political parties, but the Saskatchewan Rough Riders have won this Grey Cup three times. <laughs> they have never once won the Grey Cup while the NDP that was in power. <laughs> and if you want to ask people from Saskatchewan what is important to them, they will tell you that the success of the riders is perhaps one of the most important factors. Be screwed. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, um, you know, one thing that I will say with regards to this, and it's a reference back to uh, you know, my past involvement with the past government, we did not bring in corporate tax increases in our budget because we recognize the damage it would create to the Alberta economy to bring them in at this time and at this degree. To suggest that corporate taxes should never be touched or never be looked at, that's not what I personally felt and it's not, not really what we're looking at uh, at that time. But at the time that we were talking about this budget, recognizing the fragility of our economy, raising corporate taxes is a mistake. And it is a mis mistake to raise corporate taxes now. Uh, that's not to say that there may not be a point in time where ta corporate taxes 
could be raised without damaging the economy, but I will tell you that right now, under the current economic circumstances, raising cor corporate taxes would be a terrible, terrible mistake. Now, my friends to the far right of me will point out that uh, we were going to raise personal income taxes as well, and that is true. We had a proposal to raise personal income taxes marginally and gradually. Our proposal would have increased personal income taxes to a maximum rate of 12 percent and uh, to a marginal rate of 11.5 percent for those earning above 100,000 in taxable income, but that it was going to be phased in over 2016 and 2017 uh, taxation, taxation years. Nothing like the sudden and dramatic increases that are contained within Bill 2. And so, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to debating Bill 2 in committee and also to uh, discussing amendments to Bill 2, which I believe are necessary and would, uh, uh, would assist with Bill 2 being a better piece of legislation. I do not fundamentally agree with a number of the precepts of Bill 2. Uh, I do not want to see Alberta become the Saskatchewan of the 90s. You know, quite frankly, that's not what Albertans want, and if the party opposite suggests that that's what Albertans voted for, I would suggest that you were seriously misreading the mood of the electorate. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, I will further say that Bill 2, uh, you know, is, is, mis is certainly mistitled as far as restoring fairness to public, uh, to public revenue. Uh, you know, I would say also, Mr. Speaker, that in conducting business within this House, it is helpful to look at the experience of other jurisdictions, and I'm concerned that this government has elected to not look at the experience of our neighboring province to the east of us, uh, to see, you know, indeed a province that is just as old as our province is, that shares many of the historical features of our province, and I think from whom we could learn many valuable lessons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here, here.